If there is no proper behavior, there will be no attention. No attention means no comprehension. No comprehension can mean that the kid may not be making the most out of regular therapies that they are usually going to at home. So uh, if the speech is in the top, there are a lot of steps that the family has to climb. So common changes, usually within the first four weeks to maybe six weeks, behavior starts to change, especially because inflammation tends to drop dramatically, especially if it's inflammation associated with the gastrointestinal function. Welcome to the Regenerative Warrior Podcast, Doctor's Edition. One of the fastest growing regenerative medicine and anti-aging podcasts in the world. Each and every Tuesday and Thursday, I talk to the top experts to show doctors how to market, manage, and magnify their practice to help more people and make more money. Each episode is short and to the point without wasting your time with pointless conversation. Learn the skills to be successful without traveling to seminars or paying for expensive consulting fees. Are you ready? Because I am. I'm Dr. Ross Carter, and it's time to start the Regenerative Warrior Podcast now. Before we begin, you may have noticed that exosomes have started to become, say, the future of regenerative medicine. But before some uneducated or even unethical sales rep tells you that their product is the best, you should do your own research. I've done mine, and if you want to add exosomes to your practice, text the letter X to 561-962-1231. Again, 561-962-1231. On with the show. Hi, this is Dr. Ross Carter with the Regenerative Warrior Podcast. Today we have a special guest. If you would, introduce yourself, please. Uh, My name is Alberto Ortiz. I serve as medical director here. The best clinic that you can go to, especially if you want to combine a little bit of uh, leisure time and relaxing as well as having your treatment. I totally agree. So one of the specialties of your clinic would be children's issues. Is that correct? Yes, mostly receiving patients, pediatric patients with cerebral palsy and autism. Cerebral palsy and autism. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about how you care for a child. Well, first of all, how do you know if a stem cell procedure, and I'd like you to expand on that, would help a condition such as cerebral palsy or autism? How do you know if it's like, that's what we need, or if it's maybe they need mental counseling or something to that respect? What determines if stem cell would be a good option for a child that has a condition? Well, we part from the point that we believe that there is always room for improvement, Mm -hmm. especially from the fact that a central nervous system of a kid still has a long road for development. Now, we do have a very quick yet simple patient evaluation process, Mm -hmm. which we send a quick questionnaire, private questionnaire to the family. They can help us in that way. Myself and the rest of our medical team can actually evaluate the current condition of that kid so we can know where we're standing. Now, do you do this prior to them coming to the clinic? Yes. Can, so this is something that, let's say you're in Dubuque, Iowa. I guess that's where that is. It's some other, <laughs> you're in the United States somewhere, and then a patient can actually fill out yes. this application online before even considering coming. Before even considering. That's probably yes. a good idea. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. It's completely free. It doesn't entitle anyone to any sort of commitment of any kind. Now, after we evaluate this, either myself or our other physician invites the family to a private phone consultation or video conference or Skype or something like that. Oh, so you don't even, you can do your consultation online. Yes. That's awesome. That makes it a lot easier. And the objective of this is addressing the family's concerns and, and or questions that they may have about coming to Cancun, having the treatment, safety, which is one of the most important things. Once everything is sorted, we explain them how the protocol will take place, Mm -hmm. where the stem cells are harvested, the safety for the kid especially, which is one of the most important things to be very clear about. Right. And right after that, we give them some time, day or two days or so, and when they are ready to move forward with the decision, not to say, we need to say, Nobody is charging anything at this point. When the family is ready to move forward with the treatment, we connect them with our coordination department to address everything regarding logistics. Okay. Hotels, transportations, grocery shopping, etc., etc. Right. Everything. Right. As I was saying, you're off the record. Aside of the treatment, 
personally we like to work on the peace of mind. In the case of the kids, the kids sorry, but they don't care about the treatment. Family cares. So if we can make everything easier for them, it's a huge bonus from the experience perspective. There are a couple of protocols, children protocol included, that requires the use of hospital facilities. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, we don't work that step here in the clinic. We do it in a private hospital that maybe it's across the street is literally 10 seconds away from the clinic. I know. We have an agreement <laughs> with them so we can actually make use of the OR. We have a board certified anesthesiologist, a board certified hematologist, and we can make use of the hospital staff. So that chips in to the peace of mind of the family as well. All right, so what happens with a child that has these difficulties, these conditions? What kind of stem cells are you using? Is stem cells, correct? Right. Basically what we're using is the actual cells from the bone marrow. That doesn't mean that there is a problem with the cells of a kid with autism, for example. Okay, so that's a good question because I would want to know that. I'll be like, if my child has a health problem and you're going to use his bone marrow or hers, why would I do that? Because it doesn't it have the condition in the, the bone marrow cells? Not really. Because if you pay a little bit of attention to kids within the spectrum of different ages, you will notice that they develop normally from the physical point of view. They will have accidents, they will recover themselves, they will play, they will do a bunch of different things. That means that their repair mechanisms are working. What we are doing is collecting as much as possible of those repair mechanisms. We expand them, we prep them, we set the infusions, and then we reinfuse them back. Yeah, you gloss right over one thing that makes you different. You can expand the cells. Yeah. So if you got a bone marrow, which is available in the United States, you can get bone marrow. Mm -hmm. When you take bone marrow out of a child, approximately, on average, what would you say the amount of these stem cells would you get from a typical bone marrow aspiration without any additional work? Well, on average, since I always like to say that kids are made of rubber and magic, so <laughs> on average, we are achieving between 1.7 up to maybe 2.2 billion cells two in total. In two total. billion cells? Yeah. How many of those are actually mesenchymal cells? About 10 to 11 percent, which is substantially like 180 to maybe 200 to 110 million cells. 210 million cells yep. and that's from non-expansion yeah that's in, in its raw form okay so that and that's how much uh, bone marrow are you taking from that the sample of the bone marrow varies depending on the weight of the patient so it goes around maybe 80 cc up to 120 maybe 140 cc once again depending on the age and the weight of the patient that sounds like a lot of blood bone marrow bone right? marrow it sounds like but it's more than safe within the safety margin of, yes. of what you can actually get of bone marrow. Okay, so if you can get, you're saying, how many, 100 million or? Around 150, 160. If you can get that already from a child from regular non-expanded bone marrow, why would someone want to expand it then? Because if we are actually able to expand them, if a family wants to repeat the treatment a year later, two years, three years later, I already have the cells of that kid. So for the next treatment, we can skip the actual bone marrow aspiration. Okay, so the reason to expand is just simply so that they can do a repeat treatment without okay. taking any more. But when you're doing a procedure, after you take the bone marrow, you're not using expanded cells the first time? No, not at the beginning. Okay. Not at the, it's important to be clear about that because at the beginning, it usually takes around 21 days for a proper expansion or having the first set of expanded cells. Okay, so they would first come here, they would have the aspiration, they would get a procedure, and then some of the sample would remain, and that could be expanded for later usage. For later usage for as many treatments as the family wants. Ah, okay, so it's like an insurance policy for the health. More or less, yeah. And how many treatments does a child typically need to do to really get, I guess, maximum results? Where would you say that is? That is a very common question, but at the same time a little bit complicated to sure. answer. It's not like aspirins or ibuprofen in which you prescribe two pills every, I don't know, every six hours for the following three days. In this case, the need to repeat the treatment will be based on how the kid is progressing or is improving. Mm -hmm. There are kids that start improving within the first three to six months. There are kids that start improving maybe within the same time frame, but every kid is set in the spectrum in a different stage. 
Okay, so that goes back to well, what is the frequency that's recommended when you first start? Recommended, the minimum that we request a patient to wait for the second treatment is at least six to eight months. All right, so after about six months at least, then you reassess if they should do it again. Exactly. On average, the families that are repeating the treatment, it's between the first 12 months to maybe 14, 15 months. Okay, so they most of the families are so waiting a year. That's around the common decision. And how many times are they typically coming? Or is there like a... We have a couple of fans, let's say. Fans, okay, I like that, that word. That, that are coming for treatment, or that have been here for treatment at least four or five times. Mm -hmm. And they are sustaining, and in some cases, especially the younger kids, are gaining more skills or gaining more improvements. Let's talk about that. Uh, how do you monitor in progress of a child? How do you know if they're getting a benefit from the treatment? There are two ways. One is anecdotal, in which mm -hmm. we interview the parents, or the parent refer us to when the kid is, is achieving, or the milestones that the kid is hitting. Yes. And then there is the boring part, which is the one that we do. Before the kid arrives here for treatment, we ask the family to fill a set of questions. It's like a modified up to some evaluation questionnaire. Okay. So we ask them to fill around 33, 35 questions. Okay. And that's prior to treatment. After the treatment, within the first month, we send them the first 10 or 11 questions. Okay. Three months after the treatment, we send the second part of another 10 to 11 questions. And then by the end of the sixth month, we send the last set of questions. Note to say, the question is always the same. The idea is to try to point based on the response of whomever is answering the questionnaire, how they are noticing that the kid is changing. Got it. That way we can measure it in a mathematical way. That's why I'm saying that is the boring part. Gotcha. But you're also doing blood work as well. Yes. Tell me about that. With blood work, we run in our patients, we run CBC CAM 2011 comprehensive panel. Five panel because we had three cases in which families were not aware that the kids were hypothyroid. The thyroid, yeah. okay. Sorry to interrupt the show. If you want to add exosomes to your practice and would like some guidance, text the letter X to 561-962-1231. Again, that's 561-962-1231. On with the show. We also run hormone panel for, well, not exactly kids, but teenagers. Yes. And finally, a rheumatoid panel. Rheumatoid panel is the one that we pay the most attention because it's the one that show us some level of measurable inflammation. 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 Keyword for, for yeah, that, this journey. Yes. So inflammation is the bad guy in this uh, right here. So when you're checking inflammation, what factors are you looking at? What is the factors you're looking at with inflammation? Well, by factors, if we are actually evaluating factors, we should be paying the most attention to to monoclosis factor alpha. It's not exactly what is something. It called? TNF alpha. TNF alpha. TNF alpha. Yes. So uh, that is something that you cannot easily measure. It's, it's a very tumor necrosis factor. Tumor necrosis factor alpha. Yeah. That is the one that everybody is paying the most attention, especially in this field. Mm -hmm. Plus, we need to take in consideration that in autism there are another two things: immune deficiencies, uh -huh. and in some cases there is an association of hypoperfusion in the central nervous system. So those are the three areas in which the stem cells can be useful. How can you check for hyperinfusion? Well, hyperperfusion, it's, sure, well, you can actually do a transcranial okay. ultrasound. Uh -huh. And however, in my opinion, it's not worth it for the parents to pay for a very expensive test right. that is going to maybe point out in a measurable way that there is a problem. Gotcha. So in our opinion, it's a lot easier to educate the families and say, these are the three major issues that a patient within the spectrum is facing. Mm -hmm. If your kid is not fighting with one of them, two of them, it doesn't matter. You still need to proceed with some of your suggestions in order to try to make the best out of the treatment. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that it's fair for a family to make all this effort of coming in here and just taking what they believe it's necessary for what they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. I think that it's very, very important to provide as many tools as they can actually adopt to push their kid to reach every skill possible, not only what the family is looking for. 
And so tell us a little bit about maybe some results that you've seen. Let's go with that. Well, changes. Well, I like to categorize changes in four areas. Okay. One is behavior. Another one is social skills. Mm -hmm. Another one is motor skills, whether if it's fine motor skills or gross motor skills. Yes. And the last one is speech. Okay. Obviously, speech is the gold standard that everybody is trying to achieve. However, it's very important. I understand the importance of speech, right? Makes a lot of things a lot easier. If the family is looking for speech, but behavior is an issue, I will aim for behavior. Mm -hmm. For me, behavior is like the base of the pyramid. You cannot go to the top if you do not start from the base. Yes. So let's try to find a series of reasons or triggers or causes of why behavior is changing. If there is no proper behavior, there will be no attention. No attention means no comprehension. No comprehension can mean that the kid may not be making the most out of regular therapies that they are usually going to at home. So uh, if the speech is in the top, there are a lot of steps that the family has to climb. So common changes, usually within the first four weeks to maybe six weeks, behavior starts to change, especially because inflammation tends to drop dramatically, especially if it's inflammation associated with the gastrointestinal function. Second most common changes is social skills. Social skills is important because at least eye contact. The more eye contact or the more attention, maybe that family can go out for a dinner taking their kid because you're already working behavior. Now you have a little bit of social, maybe you have more interaction, even if it's with adults usually. Third most common changes, motor skills. Motor skills is important especially if they are in that age in which they have to start developing those skills that they can perform by themselves like combing their hair or eating using a spoon or maybe drinking using a straw, mm. right? Or maybe drawing within the lines, mm -hmm. right? Finally, the last one is not that I'm trying to discourage anyone, but it's one of the most complicated one is a speech because that is a skill that for a neurotypical person takes at least three to four years to dominate at a very basic level. Mm -hmm. If we are talking about a eight-year-old kid within the spectrum that does not have any speech, the kid needs to start dominating the motor part of the speech the vocabulary, the controlling the fine motor skills of the mouth, mm -hmm. and uh, at the end, putting three more sentences together. Right. That makes sense. Wow. That's pretty good. Comprehensive. That's why, answering your previous question, that's why it's not exactly possible for us to say, Mom, Dad, you need three treatments for your kid to be able to dominate the so bicycle just, without training wheels. Sort of so you just start with one and you, then you base the next treatment yeah. off of the questionnaires and how the patient responds and say, okay, let's do another one. Right. But the benefit is they already have the self ready. You have the self ready. Right. The self -ready. So they come back to the procedure location and then it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier. Usually the first treatment comprehends five days. Okay. So day one is physical evaluation. We also stimulate our patients with filgrastin, which is a white colony stimulation factor. That's What's it called? Filgrastin. Mm -hmm. What we're trying is like jump starting the marrow to produce a little bit more cells. Yeah. And the half life of the medication is three hours. Gotcha. Are you using anything to get the cells to go through the blood brain barrier? We usually use mannitol, mannitol, but even without mannitol, our approach as part of the protocol is performing an intratecal infusion of the cells. Ah, so it gets there. So we are actually trying to bypass in a safe way the blood brain barrier. Ah, uh, okay, so it's not an IV, it's intratecal. It's, it's two. It's both. So you get an IV, IV of the cells and plus intratecal infusion, and on the next day, but well, quickly, day one, it's evaluation, blood work, on nucleogen. Day two, it's another evaluation and another blood work in order for us to measure how the kid is responding with the nucleogen uh -huh. and another micro dosage of the nucleogen. Okay. Day number three, we meet in the hospital. So our patient is under inhaled sedation. We do the marrow aspiration. So they're, are they, they're under what kind of sedation? It's using only sevoflurane. We don't like to use nitric oxide or anything like that. Are they, is it, are they completely asleep or what? Yes, sedated only. Is, that, is it twilight? Yep. Okay. Got it. Exactly. And right after the, our patients are under sedation, we perform the bone marrow aspiration. Mm -hmm. Sustaining the sedation, we process the marrow, we prep the infusions, we perform the intratecal infusion, 
and the first IV infusion of the cells. Right after the cells, right. right. Everything, the whole process from the moment that the families arrive to the hospital up to the point that they are hopping in the van heading to their hotel is around two, two and a half hours, maybe three hours. Okay, gotcha. And the patient is asleep for the whole thing? Yeah, for the whole so thing. So once they go to sleep, they wake up, everything's done? Yeah, everything's okay. done. In fact, I always invite mom or dad to go in to the OR with us to help us with the sedation process because it's, well, at least I like to think that the easier the kid goes to sleep, the easier they wake up. Yes. Also, when they wake up, we try to for them to wake up with their parents instead with a bunch of guys dressed in a very cold place. Yeah, right. And they are a child and it's not exactly. Right. Yes. It's not like, like they can actually follow like an adult. Yes. Then day number four, we meet here in the clinic for the second IV infusion. For mm -hmm. that one, there is no need for sedation. Either Tuesday or Thursday, or both, depending on liability, we take our patients to a autism specialist, uh, therapist. Okay. I understand that at home they are doing immense amount of treatments or therapies or approaches or all those ancillary procedures. Yeah, right. procedures. What I want is to involve the parents or the tutors or whoever is in the most contact with the patient in this type of therapy. I just want them to learn three, maybe five exercises. All right. Why? It's super important after the stem cell treatment to stimulate the kids. Right. Whether if it's playing memory cards, or, I don't know, throwing cards or drawing or running, whatever, doesn't matter. The idea is try to stimulate the kid as much as possible. The objective of reaching with this therapist is to try, obviously, to work on those weak links sure. of that particular patient in order to start working and improving from that point on. Day number five, this is not for the kid. Okay. Day number five is for the family. Final interview in which we go step by step what we did, we give them back the results of the lab work, and most importantly, we emphasize a lot on the exercises. We give them the exercises printed, so they have like homework right. to practice with the kid. Sure. Perfect. All right. So that's the process of how everything works. Exactly. Wow. That's amazing. So these procedures run about $20,000, but if you're a listener to the podcast, we're going to give you guys a discount of at least $1,000. So just mention the podcast when you call and that way you get the discount. So just if you're a listener and you're interested, the price is about twenty grand, but you get a $1,000 discount. And uh, what includes, we are aware that everybody may be complaining about price ranges and stuff like that, but there is no patient that has to pay an extra penny here. So everything is considered. Hospital, hospital staff, transportation, uh, coordination services, obviously medical services. And this is five days. This is five days. Mm -hmm. Banking services, because we can store the sample for an indefinite amount of times. Or is that included? It's included in the treatment. Okay, so, you, so after they're gone, you still have work to do by expanding the cell. Yes. And so you're preparing for additional for additional treatments. And you store them. Exactly. And that's already included in the price. Right. Oh, well, that's great. So uh, we can store the sample for, I don't know, 10, 20 years if they want to. Wow. For 10, 50, 100 treatments if they want to. So that's, is there additional cost when they come back to do a treatment? Whenever a patient repeats the treatment, mm -hmm. that fee or that spot in the bank is removed. Okay. Because that actually demonstrates interest in the family to preserve the sample. Okay. If they are not coming for treatment again, but they want to preserve the sample, yeah. we design a contract for actual strict banking. And Just banking. It. Okay. That's another story. Good. Okay. So you can bank the cells and then they could keep coming back and get treatment. Yes. It also includes obviously the therapist, the laboratory tests, specialists, anesthesiologists, everything. Yeah. Thanks for listening to our podcast. Please subscribe to be notified of all new episodes and also like and share this to help us grow. To find out more about this speaker, become a speaker on our show, to have Dr. Carter present at your event or podcast, learn more about coaching, consulting, tissue allographs, exosomes, supplements, legal help, or how to create a million dollar business card to dominate your local area, we're here to help you. Just text your name and your question to 561 962 1231. Write that down. That's 561 962 1231. Or you can go to our website at drrosscarter.com. That's D R R O S S C A R T E R.com to learn more. Until next time, this is Dr. Ross Carter signing off. Signing off. <laughs>